Good morning. Good to see you this morning. It's good to be here. We're here to worship and praise God, and we'll begin by joining in the call to worship. Today is a day especially created for you to find peace and hope. Come, rest in the Lord. Let the demands of your week melt away in God's presence. And we join in singing him 496, Sweet Hour of Prayer. And I invite you to welcome one another to this morning's service.
see, we've got a few things going on. Of course, the fair is this week, so we have, need lots of helpers. The sign-up sheets are on the door there to the kitchen, and we do have a lot of openings, both for the games and for the, uh, for the uh, funnel cake booth as well. And Gloria Ann and Janet Jensen are trying to get people to uh, run the rides, right? And so uh, if you are interested in helping with any of those, give them a call. Uh, we do have most of them that are passed, and so we will be able to offer quite a few rides, but now we just need to get people to volunteer and to get trained to do that. So, okay, uh, so that's coming up Wednesday through Saturday. And uh, Monday night for the next, at least two Monday nights, and maybe the third one too, we won't have our Monday night Bible study. And we'll have to see, we'll maybe make some adjustments on that. The, the, the study on the back there, we'll get a little more information about it. The purpose of it is for people who maybe haven't decided if they want to spend time in Bible studies. And this one is, is called uh, renovation. The idea is it talks, compares uh, doing some, some uh, mod remodeling on a house and how you have to renovate it, make, bring it up to date, and, and have to take some things out, add some things new. Well, in our lives, too, sometimes in order to be able to get close to God, we need to do that as well. And so this gives us a six weeks. It talks about some of the things that we are doing good, that we need to, to continue to strengthen, things that maybe we need to remove from our life that are keeping us from God, and then other things that we can begin doing. So we will offer it. I'm just not sure exactly when exactly, uh, but if you're interested in it, let me know, and then we'll look at your schedules and, and see about that. Uh, Tuesday morning, we will have our Bible, Bible study. Uh, and then on Saturday, we will have a 5K run and a two-mile walk. We do need the youth uh, group are helping with that, but we need adults to help with that as well. And so uh, that's, uh, it starts at 7.30 on uh, Saturday, so it'll be there around 7 if you want to help with that. And uh, let's see. I think those are the main main things that we have. Oh, uh, we also announced at the early service this morning that uh, they need somebody to help uh, Saturday morning uh, with a thrift store. So most people are, have family and things, so if you're interested in helping with a thrift store on Saturday morning, uh, let, uh, let Betty allow to know about that. So I think those are the main, main things that I have. Uh, oh, no, one other thing. Uh, tomorrow night at uh, 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock to 7.30, there's a meeting here for the food bank uh, to kind of uh, meet with, with everybody, the people that help and the people that also get the food, so we can kind of talk about you know, the changes that we've made, see how those are going, see what other things we need to do to try to, to make it a, a, a worthwhile event for everybody. And then there's also some challenges. I think the, uh, the uh, commissioners are wanting to, us to move out of the courthouse, and we don't have a place to move, so got to talk about that as well so anyway so uh, if you're interested in that we'll come to the meeting tomorrow night 6 to 7 30. okay any other announcements if not we invite the kids to come forward I'm eager. Whoa, careful. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Man, that sounded good. You guys are lively today, full of energy. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> full of love. Yeah. Yeah, good. This, can you tell me what I have here in my hand? What? Nothing, yes. Because I was supposed to go to the garden and get a carrot. If I had a carrot here and I was holding it by its top and it's green, what would be down below? The root. The root? I thought that was the part you ate. And it's carrots are kind of like a root. Oh, well, guess what? Carrots aren't kind of like a root. That is the root that you eat, isn't it? What does a root do for a plant? It makes it grow. 
It does make it grow. How does it make it grow? Very good. She said it collects water from the ground so it can grow, and then it holds on to the dirt so it can't float off. And it also then gets the nutrients from the soil so that it can grow. And so the root is an important part of all plants. Some plants you eat the roots, some you don't. Some plants, I've read, have roots that go down 40 feet down into the ground. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking Potatoes, yeah, potatoes are roots too, aren't they? Yep, yep. And so we, we, eat, we eat the roots. Well, we need to have good roots too. Do our roots go down into the soil? No, but where do they go? Where do our roots need to be? Yeah, instead of down, they need to be up there with God. How do we, what do we do to get good roots with God? What's that? Say prayers. Say prayers. Very good. What else do we need to do to get good roots with God? Be kind. Be, yeah, we need to do the things Jesus did, to be kind to people. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Very, very true. Very important. What are the things to get good roots? Pray at night. Pray at night? Yes, pray at night. That's very important. What else to get good roots? Where are you right now? So is that something we need to do? Go to church and go to Sunday school. What did you do a couple weeks ago? Vacation Bible school. Yeah, went to vacation Bible school. We need to read. Some of us aren't old enough to read the Bible, but we can do that with our moms and dads sometimes, and they can tell us Bible stories like the, our Sunday school teachers do. And all of that helps us get good roots so that we can be kind and loving and forgiving and eager to come to, to church. And so we need to have good roots just like a carrot does. And when we do, then inside we can be kind and loving just like Jesus does. And that's what we want to do. We want to be really kind, gentle, loving, forgiving people. So could you please join me in an echo prayer? Dear God, thank you for Jesus Christ, who showed us how to love. He cared for everyone. And he spent lots of time with you. Help us to do the same. Help us to have good roots so we can be close to you. Help your love to shine forth so everyone will know I'm a Christian. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so, when we have good roots, we're strong and healthy and we're good in our centers. And so to remind you that, this morning, our treats are things that once you bite inside of them, you get to the center and they're good and juicy. So we have one for each of you. Okay, and I don't, is there anybody out there supposed to be doing Sunday school this morning? No, so you can go back to your seats with your moms and dads. Thank you very much for coming up today. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Time now to uh, share our scriptures with you. So the first scripture I want to share with you this morning comes from the Old Testament, the uh, book of 2 Samuel, uh, chapter 11, verses 1 through 15. We've been tell, uh, talking about David for the last few weeks. We saw where he was picked to be a king. He was just young when he did this, but he did some amazing, amazing things. He got some, won some victories for his people, and then he 
Then he decides, last week we talked about wanting to build a, a house for God, uh, but uh, God said, no, you don't have to do that. But then in this one, we get, we get a look at the other side of David. David is a human, just like us, and even though he knows what is right and what is wrong, in this story here, we see where he does a couple things wrong. He goes out and he tries to take someone's wife, and then he actually plans to kill that, that, uh, that lady's husband. And so, but we see where, hey, he did wrong, but God is much bigger than we are. God's offered forgiveness, and God still, still used David. In the spring of the year, this time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. It happened that late one afternoon, when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house, that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba's daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Then he ret she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his own house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, You have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark of and Israel and Judah remain in Booth, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping out in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie down with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today, also and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day, on the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord. But he did not go down to his house. And in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter, he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. And then I invite you to turn in your hymnals to page 746, and we'll join together in Psalm 14. Psalm 14 on page 746. And here we, we see that uh, a lot of people think there's not a, not a God, that a lot of people have gone astray, but uh, it's important that people connect with God because that's where we're delivered is from God. Psalm 14, 746. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. The Lord looks down from heaven on all people to see if there are any that are wise who seek after God. Have they no knowledge, the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? You would confound the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. And then we turn to the gospel of John, we're in chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. We have been in Mark, but we have been talking about Jesus uh, going back and forth across the, across the lake, trying to find some time uh, for he and his disciples to be alone, but the crowds keep gathering in on him. And last week we talked about him finding compassion. And then this week in John, we continue that same story. Uh, and now he, 
shows more compassion by feeding them with, with just a, with five fish and, or five loaves and two fish. And so this is John chapter 6, 1 through 21. After Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias, a large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where can you go and buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, because he knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to Jesus, There is a boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the people who had been seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This indeed is the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they had come to take him by force and to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When the evening came, the disciples went to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the Sea of Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. And now, we invite the ushers to come forward, and we'll worship and praise God by giving him our gifts.
Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, you truly are love. And we as individuals and as the body of Christ are to be love as well. And with these gifts, we share that love and pray that these gifts make a difference in the lives of others so that they may know that love as well. Please accept our gratitude and help us be loving and kind to all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn is 368, My Hope is Built. It's time now for us to share our joys and concerns. So what joys do we bring with us this morning? This morning at the early service, uh, Ruth Milliken brought a whole row of people with her. I think her house and, and J-Dub's house, they're all filled up with guests, and they've had a, been having a really good time, and it was good to see them this morning. So, and then uh, I've got my daughter, Erin, and my grandson, Graham, are here with me this morning. And so that's been a joy, and Emily was here yesterday with one of her sons, so we had a good time. And this week, of course, is the fair, and so lots going on. You're looking forward to that, aren't you? Yeah, I think so. Okay, how about other joys? Anybody have birthdays or anniversaries or anything like that? Cade's birthday is Tuesday. Cade's is? Okay. Yeah, I think it would be nice to get, since he's kind of, homebound to get in, get in some Christmas, some birthday cards. <laughs> so, and he's, he's doing okay, so that's good. Okay, other, other joys. What's, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I'm, I'm hoping you weren't like me. Yesterday when I went to the garden, I was almost 
ready to say some bad words. Look what that hail did to my garden again. <laughs> and then I thought, goodness, you know what? We need this moisture, and God has given us good moisture. And it's done its share of damage, that's true, but without it, we couldn't have things. So you... Third anniversary of their third year that they've lived here. Isn't that wonderful to celebrate things like that? It is. See, guys, they've been here forever. People like it when they're in a wonderful community like St. Francis. So we need to celebrate that. So thank you for doing that. Okay? Anybody else have any joys? Okay, well, there's lots. Yes. Oh, good. Yes, I'm glad your granddaughter and them are coming, and uh, daughter and granddaughter, and so uh, other people will have visitors as well, and it'll be a busy week, and so we just hope you, hope you have patience and, and get good rest and, and uh, enjoy the time. So, okay, other joys? Uh, my stepmom had her surgery, and she's been so well. Okay. And hopefully she'll be pain free from now on. Yay, she had her, her stepmom had her surgery, and she's doing well, and hopes she, she'll be pain-free. Along those lines, at the early service, we had uh, all the Mills family except Patrick, but he was doing good. He just sometimes likes to sleep in, she said. Uh, they do have to go back uh, uh, on Mondays, uh, but he's been doing really good, and they're thankful for that. Uh, let's see, uh, Morgan had her surgery on Friday, and it went really well. They were able to go right in through the mouth and to pull it out, and, uh, and, and she got feeling so good that she went back to work, so that's good. It, it, she had a, a salivary stone, which is something I don't usually hear much about, but it must be a really troublesome thing, and so they were able to take care of that okay. And let's see, uh, things have uh, been going well for our other cancer people, and also, uh, Vicki said this morning that her, her brother, Gordon, uh, is doing real well. He does have to uh, go back for some uh, tests and checkups and things, but uh, he's recovering real well, and so that's, that's good news also. So, okay, uh, let's see. We did, uh, oh, another bit of good news. Uh, when I went over to visit uh, Bob and Norma Gross, they said, we've got a new neighbor in the house next to us from St. Francis, and I said, yes, I know who that is, Jesse Shields, and so Jesse's moving in, and they're excited about that. On a sad note, though, uh, found out this morning that Bessie Burr's daughter, who lives in Arizona, that her husband uh, passed away, I guess yesterday or sometime this weekend anyway, and uh, have a sudden heart, heart problems, and so we want to keep, uh, keep that family in our prayers as well. Okay, any other uh, concerns or joys? Um, I was trying to think, do I have anything else? Oh, well, I think that those are the main things. Yes? With your son, I'll know this because they draw now that what kids or adults, if they're going to drive on the hills down to the fair, they have to have good shoes on. Okay, yeah, you hate to go to the fair and not get to ride the rides because you didn't have good shoes and stuff, so, yeah. Pay attention to the newspaper. They've been putting all that information in there, and so check it all out and enjoy, enjoy the fair. Uh, like I said, lots of good, good things going on. Uh, I did think of one other thing, but I forgot now. But uh, there's, you know, God's healing touch has been taking place. Oh, I know, uh, Brad and Pat aren't here this morning. Brad's picking up Pat. She's been in Texas this week, and so they've had a really good time, and so uh, we're glad, glad for that. So, Okay, anything else? If not, we're going to take time for a silent prayer where we talk and listen to God, followed up with a pastoral prayer, then we'll join together and pray the Lord's Prayer. So let's spend some time with, with God.
Dear God, we're gathered here in this sanctuary this morning. We come with thankful hearts, thankful for the opportunity to escape from out in that world, world that's continually trying to get us to be self-centered, trying to get us to think that we're more important than other people, that we should care about ourselves foremost. But forgive us. Forgive our world, which does not know what it's doing. Seems like the world has been like that since the beginning of time. Even Adam and Eve thought more about themselves than listening to the instructions that you gave them. We find out when we do that that we pay for it, that we have guilt, that the only way that we can truly receive forgiveness is to receive it from you. For your ways are much higher than ours. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. You can forgive. You can accept people for who they are. We wish that we would all be honest and upright and fulfill the commitments that we've made. But you know we don't. But you're always there reaching out, giving us a guiding hand, offering us your love and offering us hope. So help us to receive it. And then let your light shine through us. There is much darkness in the world, much people living in fear, people living without enough to eat, people living with broken relationships and broken hearts. But only that wholeness can come from you. And that's what we need to do. We need to be praying for each and every one, praying like Paul did, that the world can be turned around when we turn individually and then we share our individual stories and do our part in bringing love to all. You've heard our joys and we give you thanks for those blessings. You've also heard our concerns. Healing touch has been around many in our congregation and that's the power of prayer. And we are thankful for that. But there are many others who are in need of that continual power from prayer. So help us to pray for them. Help people learn to pray for themselves. And help people learn how important it is to pray for others as well. Help Paul's prayer be an example for all of us this morning. Because it can be a prayer that can change the world. Thank you now for Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our Savior. And we unite our voices as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to share with you now from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Paul has been uh, telling the church at, at Ephesia that they've done some, some good things. They have really uh, shown, the, spread the love of Christ, but they need to keep doing that. But also, they have a problem like most of the people in the world do, is sometimes they become self-centered. They just think about themselves. They don't really care about uh, Gentiles at all. And he's saying that this is a, this is a reason for him to reach down then on his knees and to pray for everybody because that's what we need to be doing for is pray for everybody because we all are God's family. And that's what he wants us to know. And when we think of ourselves as a family, then we can realize that together we can do a lot of amazing things. So Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner body with the power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. 
I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, even though we think we live in modern times and we've seen a lot of changes during our lifetime, I think if you really look back and pay attention to the things that are in the Bible and things that are in other historical documents, you'll find that maybe things really haven't changed as much as we thought they have. Yes, we can fly and we can talk on cell phones and we can work on computers and we can communicate all the way across the world and things, but when you look at it, people are still the same in a lot of aspects, especially in some of the negative aspects, and that main negative aspect is we're self-indulged. We're selfish. We're self-centered. We put ourselves first. And I do that over and over and over again. And I know that that's something that people do today. They've done it 100 years ago, four or 500 years ago when our country was being formed. And they did it way back in the time of Jesus. They did it back in the time of the prophets of Jeremiah and Isaiah and Daniel. And it's something that's just a part of the world. It's a part of who we are. We saw that it was right there with Adam and Eve who were told that they weren't to partake of that fruit that was in the center of the, the garden. But the serpent was able to convince them that that'll just, God just doesn't want that because it'll make you wiser than him. So they thought of themselves first and they partook of that fruit and it's been happening ever since. And so we look at ourselves, we think, why are people being mean to us? Why are people making fun of us and calling us names? Why are they bullying us around and saying we're a bad neighbor and all those other things? I should stand up for myself and make people know who I am, that I can do things, that I'm important. See, and that's what we do. We want to show off with the possessions that we have, with the material things that we have, with the jobs that we have, and show the power and the importance that we have. But it doesn't get us anywhere because we find out that we are not in control. We may think we're important, and the world may teach us that, but we don't have any power at all over offering forgiveness. We say we do, we're going to forgive people, but we hold on to it. Because we're self-centered, we want to get even. And so it's important that we learn like Paul did. Paul realized that he was just like everyone else. And so he starts off in here. Now I realize that all people need to be prayed for. We're all the family of God, he says. That's what we need to realize, all of us. It doesn't matter what language we speak, what color our skin is, if we're old or young or boys or girls or whatever, we're all part of that family. God created each and every one of us, and he is proud of each and every one of us. And when we realize that, then we can do as Paul did. Paul says, I fall down on my knees, and I'm going to pray for everybody because everybody is important in God's eyes. And if we could get over our self-centeredness and see that, then we could realize how important it is for us to pray like Paul prayed. If you notice today on the cover of the bulletin, I didn't put a picture like we usually do. Well, Julie puts it there. But I didn't have Julie put a picture there because as soon as I read this, it's like, Warren, you've read... Ephesians over and over. You've read this before, but why did you never realize how important this prayer is that Paul is praying 
that he's trying to teach one, each one of us. Jesus' disciples had trouble praying, so they asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. And he taught them what we call the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer is important. We need to pray that way. We need to know that God is our Father and he needs to, needs to be the center of our lives. But Paul's prayer also teaches us another thing that we need to do, that we need to pray for all people because they are all part of the family of God. And when we pray for everyone, we see the value that's in everyone, whether it's a little unborn baby, whether it's a baby that's just been given life, whether it's me and you, or whether it's someone who has just lost their life. Everyone is part of God's family, is important in God's eyes. And so it's important that we pray for them, not for ourselves, not so that we, our needs can be met, but we need to pray so that the inner needs of people can be met. And that's what Paul is praying for in this prayer. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with a power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. See, he's praying for everyone. He's praying, first of all, for the inner spiritual strength. I was a coach for 25 years. I participated in athletics all the time from seventh grade up. I was a manager of the track team in college. And so I've been told you need to work out and work out hard. You need to lift weights. You need to work on your agility. You need to be strong. But you know what? If I was standing right here, and if that man back there were a buffalo and he was charging at me, I don't care how strong I was, he's going to knock me to you know where. <laughs> it doesn't matter. My strength is not going to protect me. But guess what? My inner, my spiritual strength can. If I would fall down on my knees and pray, God has the power to stop that buffalo. That's what Paul is asking for first, that we all develop that inner strength. Take care of our spirits, because it's the spirit of God that's in each one of us. When he said he made us in his image, he didn't make us in his physical image, but we're in his spiritual image. We have his strength right there for the asking, for the taking. That's what Jesus Christ did. Whenever he was up against odds, whenever there were too many crowds, whenever he had been overwhelmed with things, he went out to God. He would spend hours there, maybe all night, in prayer because that's where his strength, that's where his renewal came from. And so that's the first thing that Paul is praying for, praying for the inner strength. First of all, notice individuals. That's where it begins. We have to learn as individuals to pray for our own inner strength. And as we pray for that inner strength, we have experiences of how God is being a part of our lives. If that buffalo was running and trying to knock me over and all of a sudden it died of a heart attack, I should stand up and say, hey, I didn't take care of that buffalo. God did. I've got a wonderful story to tell. And people who were in that early worship service this morning, four or five of them all, have experienced for themselves God's healing touch, his comforting touch. You can even ask Cade. He'll tell you, too, that God has been important in his recovery from his accident. The doctors and the nurses, they're all important, but their strength, their guidance, their wisdom comes from God. And so individually, we've experienced that working by God, that spiritual being part of our lives. But are we sharing that when we get together? Are we telling the stories of what we've experienced so other people will know it? See, that's what we should be doing as the body of Christ. And when we do it as the body of Christ, 
then it's easier for us to see that God is the God of everyone. Paul knows that the Israelites are doing their best to keep everyone who's not a Jew of the Jewish faith out of their church, out of their, their body of Christ. But everyone's important, Paul says, everyone. And we need to realize that as well. Everybody is important in the sight of God. And God is willing to help us all. So we need to pray for everybody's inner strength, not just as individuals, but as a body. When we all learn that, when we learn to accept the Gentiles, we learn to accept the outsiders, we learn to see the good. Just like this family of three, three years they've been in St. Francis and they're excited about it because it's been a good thing for their life. Share that story with others and maybe others who are thinking, why are we staying in this community? We're staying here because it's a wonderful place. Wherever we are and wherever we have God, that's a wonderful place. That's what we're to do. Paul also goes on then next, and he says, I'm praying for the indwelling of Christ within you. Christ! Jesus Christ, he wants him to be in each one of us. And when we know Jesus Christ, we know that Jesus Christ is love. Jesus didn't just preach one thing and then go live another way. Sure, he got angry sometimes, and he had a right to be upset with the people who were abusing the place of worship and making it a, a money-changing place. But he also, when he became upset, he went and he talked with God. When he needed something, he went and he shared with God. And he went with all people. He shared love. He went and he spent time with women. He went and spent time with Samaritans. He went and spent time with widows and with orphans and with children and with people who had been in prison. He spent time with everyone. And that's the kind of love that should be in our heart. A love that accepts people for who they are, knowing they're not perfect. David was used by God, even though he was far from being perfect. God used all kinds of people like that. Paul had done all kinds of criminal acts and done all kinds of things, persecuted people. But Jesus Christ was willing to forgive him and to use him. God, or Paul, is teaching us to pray for that, in, that dwelling of Christ within us that we can have that love, that we accept people for who we are. Because if we don't have that kind of love, we can't let go of things that have hatred and prejudices and things that are part of us. Corey Ten Boom is one of, one of the persons that I read some of her books while I was in seminary. And as we read some of these, these books, The Hiding Place was one of them, uh, I began to appreciate the things that she had gone through. As a prisoner in World War II, she was treated about as miserably as you can. She had to watch as her family was killed right there in front of her eyes, as there was one abuse after another handed out. And after the war was over, she wanted to make sure people knew about this, but they also knew about God's love. And even though she knew that she was changed, she still held things, held hatred inside of her until one time when she was preaching and get, telling this message after she had preached, people began to come up to her, like always, and tell her how much her message had meant to them. And when this one guy came up and said, this was a life-changing message for me, she looked at him and recognized that he had been one of those people in the prison that had abused her and her family. And even though she wanted to reach out and take his hand and to accept his forgiveness, she's telling herself, I gotta do this. But she couldn't. She said, I tried to move my hand and I couldn't. I tried to say that I love you, but I can't. She said, I need to though. And that's when she prayed an individual prayer. God, you can overcome what I can't overcome. 
And she said, just like that, she felt something come up from the inside and take a hold of her and reach out and accept that man for being a human being. See, that's the kind of love that we need to dwell within us because there's that selfish, self-centered love that's there trying to keep us from expanding and reaching out to everyone. So it's important that we do that. The next thing about Paul's prayer is his ability to comprehend all the dimensions of the spiritual realities. He talks about how tall, how deep, how wide. See, God's love is bigger than anything we can understand. God forgave Adam and Eve. God, today we just read what David did, but God forgave him. Look at what Paul did, but God forgave him. God's love is bigger than anything, and it's that big love that can be a part of us if we reach out and we accept it. And isn't it neat that Paul is praying that we all can have that love? What a wonderful prayer to know that people are care about us so much that they're willing to overlook our shortcomings, our weaknesses, and to see that there's hope and possibility in each one of us. What a wonderful thing. And then Paul says, I'm praying that you can have the knowledge of the love of Christ. He's not saying that we need to be smart because we can't be smart enough to know God's love. But when we've experienced God as individuals, when we share those stories as a body of Christ, as the corporate body, then we can know that Christ can overcome anything. There's nothing too big. There's nothing that can separate anybody from Christ. We try. We try to say that these bad things happen and we're mad at God, but guess what? God can overcome that. His love can overcome any type of barrier that we have within ourselves that's trying to separate us from God. Yes, Satan has lots of power, but if we as individuals and if we as the corporate body of Christ believe in these things that Paul is praying about, we can overcome everything, anything, anything's possible. And that's what the world needs. The world can change. It doesn't have to be the same 50 or 100, 1,000 years from now if we bond together as the body of Christ, if each and every person will take this prayer, at least part of this prayer that's printed here on your bulletin, and every day pray it. It'd be great if we prayed it more than once. But if we did, I want to close with these words once again. Because this is the prayer, just think, if somebody praying this for me, they care that much about me, that they care about my inner being. They care about that I have the love of Christ within me. They care about that I understand all about Jesus. Wow, wouldn't this whole world be better if everyone did that? I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being, being with the power through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. When we're filled with the fullness of God, then we can accept and love everyone. Let us be willing to accept the gift of being God's children and extend that to all the world. Let us be at peace. Amen. A closing hymn is when we are living. When we're living and when we're like Christ, then we are having this prayer fulfilled within us. 356. <laughs>